Well, hello there, and welcome back to another episode of Father Roderick Talks Star Wars. And in case you're wondering, who is that Father Roderick? That would be me. And we're going to talk about the second chapter of The Mandalorian. Now, if you're a fan like me, you've already watched a ton of breakdowns, analysis, where are the Easter eggs, so I'm not going to do that, because that wouldn't add much to the table. What I'm going to do is to talk about the mythological and religious themes in this episode. And there are actually a lot of things happening that you may at first think are just happenstances, just random uh, elements of the story. But in fact, they're very much Star Wars. And they are Star Wars because they've got this mythological background. You may know that George Lucas uh, has always focused on Star Wars being this mythology. In fact, the reason that the Mandalorian feels like a Western may be very well on purpose. Um, George Lucas, when he started to think about, you know, telling stories and, and as a young filmmaker, he looked at uh, the Westerns that back then were a, a genre that was in decline as a sort of modern mythology. Uh, these stories about explorers, you know, on the frontier, where it's dangerous, where you have to reinvent yourself, where you can discover new things. For, for him, those stories of the Wild West were uh, stories that conveyed values of courage, of perseverance, of friendship, uh, also uh, challenges that are part of life. And those stories teach or taught, were supposed to teach the, the viewers and the readers um, the, 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 the values that really count. Because it's when these values are tested in dangerous situations, that's where you realize what is truly important. And George Lucas kind of uh, regretted that, that the Westerns didn't really work anymore for his generations. This, is, this was kind of in the 70s. And, and that's how he started to think about, I need to develop a new mythology, because it was his purpose uh, that as a filmmaker, um, his stories would transmit these values uh, from one generation to the next. And he was very, very well aware that uh, the old belief systems often didn't work that, that well anymore. Uh, kids, even back then, didn't go to church that much. A lot of people didn't really read the ancient religious books anymore. And he was very aware of, this, of the power of, of stories to fill that gap. And so that's how he got the idea for Star Wars. So the fact that this Star Wars series harkens back to the, the glory days of, of, of the Wild West and of these stories that were told in these Westerns, um, I think uh, kind of it, it brings everything back, back to the beginning where, where George Lucas started. And I think that's maybe why this is such a good match. You know, the story of uh, outer space and a long time ago fairy tales, fantasy in combination with Westerns and the, and the language, also the visual language of these Western movies. I think um, it, it, it works so well because they all have this underlying mythology. So I found seven elements, seven mythological key elements in this episode that I wanted to highlight. And it may give you another appreciation of this episode, which of course is already so good that I don't really need to give you reasons to love it. Uh, but I just want to enhance your, uh, your overall experience of, of this series. The first thing I want to say is that this uh, story of the Mandalorian in many ways uh, it totally works along the lines of, of Campbell's uh, uh, explanation or theory of the hero's journey. Um, Joseph Campbell has been a major influence on, on George Lucas's storytelling. And so Campbell uh, developed this theory that in all the important mythological and religious stories, you will see common elements. And he tried to distill those elements and uh, kind of make a... Um, like take, take them out of the context of these stories to, to show how these, the, the, the story of the hero's journey returns time and again and is the foundation of our own, uh, our own journey through life. And uh, I will give you some examples. So according to Campbell, there are actually three big phases, you could say, steps in that, in that hero's journey. The first one is 
the hero has to leave the world as it is. So it's stepping out of your routine. And uh, there's usually uh, a, a quest, a trigger, that will begin the adventure. Uh, it will be the, the, literally the call to adventure, or in biblical terms, the vocation of the hero. And you totally see that in, in The Mandalorian, where we are introduced to, to the hero um, when he's still uh, just doing his job. He's, he's, it's a very exciting action scene in the, in the first chapter, but it's just what he does. And when he uh, hands in the bounties to get his money, you learn that these are actually very common tasks, things that he's done over and over again. And then he's offered again the same old bounties, the same old quests that he's always done. Except for this time, there is this special quest. There is this thing that no one has ever tried, or at least no one has ever, ever succeeded in, uh, in doing. And that is to go on this quest to find Kind of something like that feels a bit like the Holy Grail. I get back to the, to that. So it's this this ultimate prize that people have tried to capture, but no one has succeeded. And this is the call to adventure, and that is the first step in the in the journey of our hero of the Mandalorian. And later on, we we realize that Baby Yoda, this child that he finds is his call to adventure. Um, uh, so the, the, this is the second theme. Um, it is in, in many old stories, medieval stories, it's the story of the Holy Grail. It was originally, uh, in, according to legend, it was the cup that Jesus used after the Last Supper um, and that he shared with his apostles saying, you know, this cup contains my blood. The blood is my life that I give uh, for the forgiveness of sins and for your uh, redemption. And so the, according to the, these old stories, this cup would have been preserved and it was called the Holy Grail. And if you would drink from it, think Indiana Jones, you would receive eternal life, which is not a magical thing like the way it was uh, narrated in, in the third uh, Indiana Jones movie. But it's of course because, it, at least in the Catholic faith, this blood is really uh, redeeming blood. It is shed so that we may live forever and that we may live uh, um, without the, the, the bounds, without the, the shackles of sin anymore. Um, so this, this holy grail has always been in these mythological stories the ultimate prize to, to conquer. And in uh, this episode, there is a funny... Um, I, I think small twist in the uh, the quest where he needs to retrieve this egg, and I'll get back to what that means. But the, and, and an egg, of course, a very highly symbolic object, and because the Jawas apparently uh, very much really want to have that and are willing to trade everything they stole for that one egg, you think, oh, that must that must be the holy grail for the Jawas. That must have must be some mystical thing or whatever. Well, it turns out, no, it's just a snack. <laughs> and, and then you discover with the Mandalorian, because we're going this journey with him, that the actual Holy Grail, the true prize, is that baby, is that child, well, 50-year-old baby, is Baby Yoda. And that is the ultimate prize that the Mandalorian now has conquered and what's going to be the next, the next thing. So the, the, in the hero's journey, you've got uh, so this, this, this quest, the beginning of the adventure, the vocation, the calling, the call to adventure. The second step is trials. It's a very standard ingredient of, of all mythological stories and also of most Star Wars stories that then the hero is tested. He doesn't become the new person that he's called to be right from the get-go. No, he has to go through all these trials, all these tests, where his resolve, where his courage, where all these values are put to the test, and then it will be revealed if he truly is the hero or not, and if he can really change and adapt to whatever life throws at him. So, it, but before I, I go to those, um, those trials, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about this, the Holy Grail in this story, about baby Yoda. Last week, I uh, shared with you a theory that I wouldn't be surprised if that baby actually truly was going to be Yoda, 
wasn't going to be like Yaddle's child. Yaddle is also, you know, a, a female uh, um, example of, of Yoda's uh, species. And she's been on the Jedi Council in the prequels. And I also didn't really think that they were going to in introduce like another, like a third member of that species. I was like, well, what if, I, I just have this feeling that it actually is Yoda. And, but I just couldn't really wrap my mind around it. So I came up with this theory that maybe he's a reincarnation of Yoda, just like, you know, the Dalai Lama in a certain way. But then of course, all of you were like, no, no way, that's impossible. Because first of all, the child is 50 years old, which means it was born even before the beginning of the Clone Wars. So Yoda was there already, so it can be a reincarnation. Plus, we've seen the Force Ghost of Yoda later on in the sequels. So <laughs> both those elements totally uh, invalidate that, that idea that this is a reincarnation. But then I was like, is there another way that this still could be Yoda and that fits in the kind of the, 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 the overall story that we already know of, this, of the Star Wars galaxy. And I'm thinking, a clone. This, this could totally be a clone. And that would also explain the interest of the Doctor. You remember, what's his name, uh, Dr. Pershing, that we are introduced to in Chapter 1. According to some fans that, that went frame by frame to the scenes with this Doctor, he carries on his sleeve uh, a symbol that you also see on Camino in the clone factory. And so what if, and this is just a theory, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about that in, in the comments. Um, what if this is actually a clone of Yoda that was commissioned maybe by the emperor um, to, I don't know, have, have an evil Yoda at his side? The emperor knows very well that Yoda is just as powerful as he is, maybe even more powerful. So how amazing would it be for him and for his plans to, to uh, take a clone and subvert it to the dark side and have that as his new apprentice, maybe, uh, his Padawan. He can't, he can't possibly convince the old Yoda to become his Padawan, but maybe a younger version of Yoda could be turned. It totally sounds like something the Emperor would, would come up with. And what if Dr. Pershing, back in the day that the Empire was still around, was involved in this whole plan of trying to raise this clone and experiment upon it and try to figure out how it could be turned. I think there's something there. But anyway, for this episode, it doesn't really matter what the identity is of Yoda and, and, or, or baby Yoda. And, and it actually, it maybe we'll, we'll, never, we'll never really uh, learn where this baby Yoda comes from. Um, and that would match what George Lucas himself has said many times about Yoda. He's always, let's not explain too much about his origins or where he's from, or that's why we have never learned about his species, or we don't know even what the species is called. Because for George Lucas, this was the mysterious helper. Um, and I'll get back to that. That's also a, a, a very common element in mythological stories. It's kind of, kind of like an angel in a certain way with, with uh, supernatural powers, and, but you don't, it's, he's part of the mystery. And as long as you have a mystery in the story, there's always more questions to ask. There is no more to explore. It gives you the sense that the galaxy is more than what you see. It's more than blasters and lightsabers. And, and, and so the mystery in the heart of a mythological story is teaching us that life is ultimately a mystery. And we will never be able to wrap our minds around, uh, around our existence and, and the reason why we're here. We can only approach the mystery, but we'll never get to the end of it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a mystery anymore and life would be so boring. So uh, now that the Mandalorian has this holy grail, it's actually a very early giveaway in a certain way. It's like he's already reached the goal of, of this huge quest. So there are bound to be trials. Uh, he's not there yet. It's not that next week we're going to see how he just hands in uh, Baby Yoda and then he goes on another adventure. No, 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 no. Now it's up to him to survive the real test. The, 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 it was actually a, a pretty easy uh, accomplishment for him to, to retrieve this baby Yoda. Um, but the real test is going to be the trials. And that's starting in this episode. And all these trials that we see in chapter 2 are highly symbolical. 
First of all, what's the first trial? Well, of course, it is the Jawas. He abandons his ship while he is uh, trying to retrieve Baby Yoda. And when he returns, he sees that the Jawas have taken everything. The entire outer hull of his ship is gone. If you look closely, there's a freeze frame that you can see where, where when, once he's retrieved all the material from his ship, that they even stole his toilet. You know, the weird toilet that we see in, uh, in the lower deck of, of his ship. Even that was stolen by the Jawas. And um, I think that this... His first trial is, is losing his protection. So the, the hull of the ship is necessary to get anywhere. It's necessary to be protected when you're out there in the vacuum of space. It's your protection when you're attacked and everything. And so he loses that protection of his ship. And, and it's almost like a skeleton. You can see straight into the heart of his ship. And the same thing happens to himself later on when he's attacked by the Mudhorn or whatever that monster is called from the cave. Um, he too loses his, his, the plating of his armor. And once his, you know, the breastplate is completely ruined and, and that makes him extremely vulnerable. So the, the, the mythological aspect of this is the hero has to learn that his strength comes not from his outer hull from human protection. It is something else that will keep him alive and that will give him strength. Um, and so, and also this, this deconstruction of the hero and his ship is actually an opening so that his true self can come forward. So when, when your outer armor falls, falls away, um, you know what, what is inside? We can look inside and what is there? What is his true strength? Maybe his perseverance, his courage, his endurance to, you know, like Rocky, it doesn't matter how much, how often you're beaten down. What matters is how often you get up again and, and, and start to fight again. So that is, I think, the meaning of this, the stripping down of both the ship and of the Mandalorian. Um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the next step in that is, of course, he will need to be rebuilt. He gets a, a new armor, a new, I don't know, new, new, a new breastplate or anything. So there's also, you know, laying off the old you and becoming a new you. That's part of the hero's journey. You have to leave, it's like baptism in the Catholic Church or in, in, in any Christian church, is you, your old self dies and you're reborn from the water the water is kind of the symbol of death also. And, and so that's the ultimate test, the ultimate trial that we have to go through. But once you are reborn from the waters of baptism, you receive, literally the, the, the newly baptized would receive uh, a, a new piece of cloth, a, new, you know, a robe, a white robe to symbolize, I have new clothes, I have, I'm a new person. So that's happening also to our hero, the Mandalorian. And, other, and these trials are part of the initiation process that I mentioned also uh, last week. So we see that in his own faith, uh, his own religion, I should say, the Mandalorian is slowly initiated. This new piece of, of armor on his shoulders, uh, he receives that as part of his initiation, part of becoming truly a Mandalorian. And you have to keep in mind that this, we're talking about a foundling. So in the, one of my followers uh, in the comments uh, explained that very well, and you can go back to the comments of, of the previous episode where you can read it in full. Mandalorians would always inherit the, the armor from their parents, but in this case, we're talking about uh, a foundling. So he doesn't have an armor that he received from his parents, and that is why part of initiation, if his initiation is to receive this armor bit by bit, piece by piece. So he's not, maybe not truly a full-grown Mandalorian yet. Um, and so, but also these trials are part of this initiation on a, on a whole different level. This is about much more than becoming a Mandalorian or the Mandalorian religion. His world is about to become so much bigger than that. And that is what we see in um, uh, the next trial, the next te test, this is the fourth mythological element. 
It is facing an opposition to your belief system. Um, it's, it's a confrontation between your religion, your values, and other systems, other belief systems, other sy moral systems, other uh, values. And uh, you remember in this scene when, when he goes to the, to the Jawas together with uh, 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 Quill, um, he can only approach the Jawas and start to negotiate if he lays down his weapon. And it turns out his weapons, because he's got multiple weapons with him. And he says, well, but carrying this weapon is part of my religion. In other words, I cannot negotiate. This is non-negotiable. This is, this is who I am. And then uh, Quill has to convince him that in order to get anywhere, you also have to learn to be pragmatic from time to time, or at least to, to make room for, for uh, uh, in this case, the Jawas, who have a totally different belief system, couldn't care less about you know, your religion and what weapons mean in your religion. Uh, their religion is trade, it's economy. You know, it's, if you abandon your ship, then our belief system says we're, we're, it's there for us to take. And once, it, once we take it, it's no longer yours and you cannot take it back by force. You will have to bring something to the table. You have to trade. And so, and that is, that's a very difficult task. Uh, if you are convinced that of, of your religion, uh, that those are the values that, you, that are part of your identity, like overstepping that, and, and, and acknowledging that maybe other people, other creatures may have totally different belief systems and that, you know, my norms and my values are, are not, you know, absolute or I, at least I cannot impose them on, on others. Uh, that is a very difficult step, but a very important step in, in this growth, in this initiation. The world is bigger than just you and your beliefs. So he has to learn the ways of quid pro quo. You know, I can't get back the quit if I don't have a quo that I hand in. And in this case, it is going to be this egg that the Jawas want. And I said, already mentioned the egg normally, symbol of life, uh, symbol of power, myster mystery of life as well. Um, but in this case, it is, uh, uh, it is just a temporary quest, a side quest, you could say, in, in gaming terms, that he needs to accomplish before he can get his stuff back. But in order to get the egg, he got, he's got to go to the, through the next trial. And of course, trials are always, you know, in, 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 in mythological stories, in religious stories, they always go from easy to more difficult to impossible. And that is what hap what's happening right here in this fifth uh, story element, this mythological story uh, element, which is he has to face the dragon. Every good, you know, fairy tale needs to have a dragon. Um, Cinderella, uh, but also think of um, uh, the Hobbit, you know, Schmauk. It, and, and usually this dragon, Siegfried also, uh, usually this dragon is guarding a treasure is defending a castle that the hero needs to go to, or actually wants to own. Um, in, in, in The Hobbit, it is Schmauk who has stolen the gold from the dwarves, and now it's his treasure. And in order uh, to get that treasure, you need to defeat the dragon. Uh, in in uh, Greek mythology, the story of, of Siegfried, um, Wagner wrote a whole opera about it. The dragon is, uh, what's his name again? Um, Far Fafner. Actually, he's a, a dragon in the story, but he used to be kind of like a demigod or something like that. He is guarding the ring that, that Siegfried, Siegfried needs to have. And so he has to face this dragon. But the dragon itself is a symbol, is a mythological element that usually represents... Or, or symbolizes your fears. It's, you know, the dragon is the most fearsome animal that you can, or I'm not even sure if it's, it's an animal, but it's a, the f most fearsome mythological creature that you can face. There's no creature more, more powerful, more dangerous than a dragon. And 
facing this dragon is facing your fears and overcoming your fears. By, by killing the dragon, you eliminate your fears. And so that's what we see happening when uh, our hero, the Mandalorian, descends into the mud cave. Also highly symbolic, of course. Think of Luke Skywalker who have, on, on Dagobah has to face his fears by going into this old ancient forest tree and then in the darkness there discovers his greatest fear and it's Darth Vader. And when he slays Darth Vader, or actually when he's slain by Darth Vader, we discover, well no, actually no, it's, it's Luke who slays Vader and then the mask breaks open and he sees only himself. So again, it's this confrontation uh, of, of your ultimate fears. In um, The Last Jedi, there is a similar mythological scene where uh, um, Rey descends into the cave on the island uh, where Luke lives and f also faces her greatest fear. What is her greatest fear back then? It's to, to have no identity, to be no one, to have no parents. And so she approaches this mirror and the only thing she sees is herself. Why? Because that's her greatest fear, that it's only her, that she has no parents. And then she, she sees these two figures approaching and it's like Harry Potter and the mirror of Erised. And, and she thinks that maybe that now finally my parents are gonna be revealed to me. And what she sees is again, just her own reflection. That is her, you know, dragon moment where, where the, 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 the greatest, fear that she has is to realize that she's alone. Um, but anyway, here it is another dragon. It's this, this mud horn, this in, in, almost invincible creature that is so huge and powerful. And you even have this eye moment, you know, where he's like looking around with the lamp on his, on his helmet. And then you think you're looking at some, you know, a muddy rock and then all of a sudden pff, the eye opens and it's, of course, uh, an homage to the scene in, uh, in The Hobbit where Bilbo is, is looking around and then thinks the dragon is sleeping and all of a sudden that eye just opens and is <gasps> Or in, um, was it in Pinocchio? Where uh, Pinocchio is, is, is about to be swallowed by the whale and then there's this huge eye of the whale. So it's always it's a symbol of the eye. It is, oh, your greatest fear. Um, evil is, is staring me in the eye. And then, uh, of course, you see the struggle with this. It's the fight. This is impossible uh, a fight between a Mandalorian, and even though he's got his harness, it, 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 it clearly doesn't really serve him, doesn't protect him, and he's just about to get killed. And that is where the sixth mythological story element kicks in, and this is maybe the most important one, um, at least in this, this this is part of the, of the hero's journey of all these trials. And that is the realization that you're, you cannot protect yourself. Your armor, who you were up until that moment is not enough to become who you are supposed to be. You need supernatural help. You need something, someone that is greater than you. You need a force that is stronger than your own strength. So it's this, transcendental moment where the hero realizes that that he is surpassed by a mystery that is greater than him and that you cannot live you cannot truly uh, continue to live um, or reach your destiny without that supernatural help um, in in stories in fairy tales it's all it's, it's always you know creatures like elves um, Galadriel, I don't know, Wizards, Gandalf, um, and in this case, of course, that supernatural help is baby Yoda. It is what you least expect to be this powerful. It's literally the smallest creature that we see in this episode, except for maybe these, these lizards that are hopping around there, around the, the mud cave. Um, but the, the true source, or maybe not the source, but the conduit of this supernatural help is going to be this, this baby. And it reaches out just like Yoda did uh, on Dagobah when Luke has to, you know, uh, one of his trials is to lift his, 
uh, X-Wing fighter from the swamp and he thinks he can't do it. And here again, uh, this small child shows you that the strength that flows through him is, does not depend on how big you are, how strong you are. This is not a warrior. It, the Mandalorian here discovers the, the exact same thing that Luke discovered on Dagobah and that, he, that Yoda taught him, and that is the Force. If you let the Force work through you and you are open to the Force, then that Force will do miracles. In many ways, the Christian, Catholic equivalent of this would be the sacraments, where I'm, as a priest, uh, the, distributing the sacraments, and I believe that that can truly help people, but it is not because of, you know, my uh, talents or anything, but it's because I, I, as a priest, I'm supposed to be the conduit for a force, for the Holy Spirit, who is much more powerful than I will ever be. And my job is to be as open as possible and to, to not be in the way of this force. And, and that is why these sacraments always communicate supernatural help and supernatural strength. And without it, a priest is just, it's just a guy. It's just, a, just a, a regular human being. And I'm very much aware that I'm just a regular guy, just like you and, and anyone else. But I also know that it's this, there is this mystery that, and I can't explain it, um, but that works through me. But it, I'm not the source of it. it it's, it's transcendent. It's from beyond me. So that is uh, this supernatural help, a very, very important element. And of course, super Star Wars, this is without the Force. And I was so happy to see that we get to see the Force also in this, in this series. Because, well, initially I, I, I thought the Mandalorian is just going to be uh, about this bounty hunter. Will it be Star Wars enough? Well, it becomes Star Wars because the Force is at play here in the outer reaches of the galaxy. And then we go to the third phase of the hero's journey. And that's the phase where the hero returns and shares with his friends or family or whoever, you know, he left when he left home, he shares what he has learned. So this entire journey is what we call a liminal experience. You step out of your world, you, you submerge yourself into a different universe, that's where you discover who you're supposed to be. You learn all sorts of things, but then it's also time to step back into the real world and apply what you have learned. Um, in, in many ways, watching Star Wars, watching The Mandalorian, it, for all of us, every episode is a liminal experience. If it's a good story, we forget about our day-to-day -day life. We forget about school, we forget about our job, about whatever worries us. And for, you know, in this case, like 30 minutes, we're in this galaxy far, far away, a long time ago. And we're in a different world, but a world that can still teach us about our life and about the choices that we make. That's, that's the, the whole idea of stories and the whole idea of mythology. So we learn by, in a certain way, empathizing with the Mandalorian. And then once the episode is finished, hopefully we'll have learned something that we can apply in our day-to-day -day life. So what are the takeaways from these episodes? What have you learned? Well, that's something that's going to be different for, for each and every one of us. And that's why we share that. Well, you know, so the, the moment you start to comment in the comment section, um, that's actually our part of the hero's journey. That's where we return and when we have discovered important things, we want to share that. It's part of, of, of who we are. We, we cannot keep it for ourselves. We want to, you know, hand it out and, and let other people know. And then maybe they have discovered other things and, and uh, we learn from each other. So in this case, um, the, of course, the, the, the total journey of our hero is not finished. Um, you know, <laughs> otherwise, they could wrap up the, ep the, the entire series right now, and, but they're already shooting the, the, the second season. So, but there is a little bit of a homecoming here, and that's when he returns to, to Quill, uh, Nick Nolte's character. Um, and he tells 
Quill, what he has learned about this child, uh, about you know what happened during the trials, maybe even what he learned from negotiating negotiating with with the uh, with the Jawas, and part of what you discover at the end of your journey is that you're no longer the same. Who you were uh, doesn't matter anymore. It's it's a new life, new rules, and we learn that Quill has already completed his journey. He's gone through an adventure that we have not learned so far, but what we do discover in this episode is that he has been freed, or he has freed himself from servitude, as he calls it. Maybe slave, uh, you know, being a slave. Uh, one, of, one of the things that we know from, from his species, because they're, so, because they're so good with machines and technology, they were often uh, employed by the empire as slaves. That's or why we probably see them on, on Bespin and in other situations. But he has already completed his journey. So when the Mandalorian wants to hire him, you know, I'd like to have you on my crew. He's like, no, no, I'm no longer, that's no longer me. I'm, I'm no longer in anyone's service. I'm free and I live my own life. And I think that's the freedom that the Mandalorians will still have to have to discover for himself or has to conquer for himself because um, I think one of the one of the things that we realize is that he is not entirely free he may be super you know courageous and a very uh, efficient good bounty hunter but just the whole idea that he's a bounty hunter means that he's not free he still needs to do this work in order to survive, right? To, to uh, become a Mandalorian or whatever. Not all Mandalorians are bounty hunters. So he still is on this journey. And, and it's from these companions, these what they call in, or what Campbell uh, in uh, the hero's journey calls uh, hero companions. And Quill is one of these friends. And I bet you there are gonna be many more friends that will, do, that will meet and encounter uh, along, the, along the journey in the, in the future episodes uh, that will also help the Mandalorian in his journey to become free and to discover what truly matters in his life. So um, what is it that he shares with Quill? What is it that we see at the end of this episode that he has learned through these trials? Well, that's the seventh mythological element, and it's a very important one in, in the mythology of Star Wars, and that is he learns what it means to be a father, or what it means to be a father figure, to be a protector. So he discovers something that he has not experienced himself as a foundling. He has no parents. So here, here he steps into a role that he's not familiar with, but it may be one of the most important things for him to learn, that there are actually creatures that you can care about and that, are, that you have such a strong bond with that those creatures become more important than the prize, than money, than maybe even your, your, your own identity. He constantly thinks that um, he needs to he needs to conquer the trials the the, the dragon the the mud the mud horn um, and initially it's just to protect his prize to protect the holy grail to protect you know his bounty but he more and more starts to act as if he you know he needs to defeat the monster because it's threatening there are like all these threats to the life of this child and it's the child that he needs to protect not, and the child is no longer a bounty because he becomes more than a bounty hunter. He becomes a father to this child. And the father-son dynamic is so quintessential Star Wars. You know, it's Luke and Vader. And, it's, and also the inversion of the father-son role. You know, the father is supposed to be the protector, right? Well, with Luke Skywalker, it's the son who becomes the savior of his father. I believe there's still good in you. And ultimately, it's the son who disarms his father, take, take off this mask so I can look you in the eye. 
and thereby revealing his true self. And you know what? His true self is not to be the Dark Lord. His true self, despite all these years and years of servitude to the dark side, but his true calling, his true identity is to be a father, is to be Anakin Skywalker, the father of Luke and Leia. And, and that is why we see him in the end as a force ghost, because he's truly become himself. That, that, so that's the hero journey of Anakin in the, in the original uh, movies. And here, uh, and, and it's this, this very touching scene when he's flying away in the ship and, and he looks at the, you know, the child, Baby Yoda, and uh, Baby Yoda's exhausted because, well, he hasn't had much experience in, in wielding the force to these, with these you know, huge uh, animals um, and monsters. But then the child opens his eyes and you see this father-son moment, or we don't even know if it's a he or a she, but you have this father-child moment where the Mandalorian, and I think this is amazing how they pull it off because you, the actor can't show his face. So he has to act with movements, with gestures. And it's, it's a, so powerful. I thought it was a very emotional scene at the end. And, and you feel that beneath that mask, a father has been born in this episode. And that was very touching and very moving. Um, I bet you that we'll see much more of the repercussions of this discovery of this fatherly role uh, by the Mandalorian and what it means for his quest. But anyway, enough for today. I'd love to hear your thoughts about this. I hope that this contributed something uh, other than what you've seen in all the other YouTube videos. It's for me, it's all still kind of trying to figure out what, what I can you know, add to uh, all the other great, great videos and podcasts that are out there. But hopefully this, this has been useful. Let me know in the comments. Let me know if this is a, a good direction for, for this show or if you want to do more like a Q&A type of thing or whatever. I'm always open for your suggestions. If you want to help me do more of this and if you want to support me in my journey <laughs> to, you know, to becoming a, a, a better YouTuber and a better podcaster and a better... Uh, media producer, then um, th there is a way in which you can support me, and that is by becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash fatherroderick. Um, it's still very simple. I don't have much to offer in return other than to do what I do, and hopefully if that's of value to you, then maybe you can help me uh, by uh, keeping this advertisement free, and uh, I'm doing this... Uh, as much as I can. All right, thank you so much for, for watching. I hope to see you next week. And if you want to see me earlier, uh, then keep an eye on my Facebook uh, page or my Twitter feed, at Father Roderick, because I record two, actually three podcasts every week, two for everyone and one for my patrons. Um, and I always announce it on, uh, on Twitter and Facebook when I go live. So again, thanks for watching. May the Force be with you and God bless.